good to be with you all. If I've not met you before, my name is Ashley Johnson, and I don't always get to be here at the Village Campus, but I serve as a director of women's ministry for Renolda Church, and what a great job it is. What a great job it is. Um, I uh, know that last week Anne talked a little bit about Christmas gifts and perplexed about how her mom would get so excited about things like vacuum cleaners, <laughs> and now we get it, right? But can I share with you a couple of my Christmas gifts? I brought them, and they're pretty fun. Your girl got a new bag. Right after my husband said, whatever you do, don't ask for another bag. I'll have you know, I did not even ask for this. And my mother-in-law came with this. So great. Can use it for work. Can use it for just life and fun. She didn't only get me a bag. She got me a new wallet to go in it. Isn't that so nice? Kind of a themed gift. And I feel like it's hard to pick out a wallet for someone, right? This shows you how great of a mother-in-law she is. She did this for her daughter-in-law and was on point. Um, to, be, to be fair, she brought my sister-in-law, Courtney, her daughter, who is a little fashionista. She's the girl you always want with you when you're shopping to help you. And Courtney actually has this very same wallet, so she helped her do that. Well, just this past weekend, I finally got around. I had been carrying both wallets in my bag, and I hadn't yet switched over from the old wallet to the new wallet. It's kind of a whole thing, right? So I had to have some space to do that. So this weekend, I finally did that. The thing about my old wallet is it was very large. And the pro to that is you can fit all the things. You can fit all the little cards and receipts and business cards. You can fit all the things. The con is that you have no idea what's in there. <laughs> I mean, no idea. Everything just gets lost, right? And, and I think as women, however big the space is, we'll fill it, yeah. Wh whatever it is, right? If it's a little purse, big purse, big wallet, small wallet. So as I started going through here, y'all, I found a treasure trove. I want you to know I am rich <laughs> with gift cards. <laughs> Tons of stuff, let me tell you. Um, some of these were just gifts that we got this year. My husband's a pastor on staff here, and some very kind people got us some things. We have gift cards to Fratelli's, the steakhouse down the street. Yeah, that's going to be fun. Um, one to Outback. I found one to Longhorn Steakhouse. Uh, there was one Visa gift card I got real excited. I got on the website. You know, you type it in. You put in the number. 96 cents. So that one wasn't worth holding on to in the new wallet. But I did find one, an old birthday present, $50 on this guy right here. I didn't even know I had, okay? I got a free burrito at Bar Burritos waiting on me. Um, $50 to Moselle's, $5 to Starbucks. My kids each have a Dairy Queen gift card. We've got $2.87 on one and $3.09 on this one. Right here. Can you all see this? Chick-fil-A, $15, $15 to Chick-fil-A. I am rich with gift cards. I just need to do something with them. Because right now they mean nothing. They're pieces of plastic. I haven't redeemed them yet. But speaking of Chick-fil-A, oh, I forgot to bring my phone up here. That's okay. Does anybody have the Chick-fil-A app? Is that not the best app on your phone? The best app on your phone. My husband, this summer, we were doing a, um, we do summer saturate gatherings with the Union Cross campus all together in the summer, and we're talking about how to live missionally in our world, and one of the things that he taught on was when he was talking about evangelism and sharing our faith, he says, listen, it's not his phrase, he borrowed it from, from another pastor, but he said, you talk about what works. Isn't that the truth? You talk about what works in your life. How many conversations have y'all been in about Instant Pots or air fryers lately? <laughs> right? I got those for Christmas too, both of them. I had a great Christmas this year. By the way, last night in the Instant Pot, I made spaghetti and meatballs for my family. You start with frozen meatballs. You put the raw spaghetti right on top of it. A couple spices, the jar of spaghetti, a jar of water or chicken broth. I am not kidding you. That thing only pressure cooks for three minutes. One pot, you're done. I'll get it to you. I'll get it to you if you want it. It's so good. But anyway, you talk about what works. This Chick-fil-A, it's a miracle, that's right. This Chick-fil-A app works 
this Chick-fil-A app works. You put in your order before you get there, you pull on the property, Chick-fil-A's figured out how to geofence their property so they know when you arrive. It pops up on your phone. Looks like you're at, you know, the Knollwood Chick-fil-A. Would you like for us to start preparing your order? Why, yes, I would. <laughs> they can bring it to whatever table you're sitting at. You can go through the drive through It's amazing. And let me tell you what else. All I have to do to get more Chick-fil-A is buy Chick-fil-A. I don't even know how many points I'm going to get. And every time they put points on my app, and there's this little button down at the bottom that says, Redeem. And I just push on there, and it pops up. Y'all, I'm only 40 points away from a Chick-fil-A sandwich for free. I'm getting so close. You get to just redeem this free stuff. Wouldn't it be great if all of life were like that? What if we had something or someone who could redeem not square pieces of plastic from the bottom of our purse or accrued points on an app, but the broken pieces of our lives. I'm hearing some really good news today because we're diving into a series in which we'll explore what it means to know God by name and what a wonderful reality it is that we have a God who has the name above all names, And he's chosen to make himself knowable to us. There's no way that in this semester together we're going to exhaust the names of God. But we are going to look at some really wonderful, majestic uh, aspects of his character. And this week we're going to talk about God, our Redeemer. Our Redeemer. To redeem means to buy back, to repurchase to get or win back. It means to free from what distresses or harms, such as to free from captivity by payment of ransom or to release from blame or debt. It means to clear. To redeem means to repair or restore, to free from an obligation of payment, to atone for or extinguish guilt, to make worthwhile. In order to understand God as Redeemer, we need to pick up in the biblical narrative right where Anne left off last week. So she began at the outset of Exodus, and at the outset of Exodus, the people of God are enslaved there. They're numerous, but they're enslaved, and they're crying out for God to set them free. And he raises up a man named Moses. Now Moses is unique because he has this really uh, unique positioning. He's born a Hebrew, but he was raised in the court of Pharaoh. And as Anne shared last week, God calls to Moses from a burning bush. He reveals himself as Yahweh. He says, I'm the God that that I am because I am. And so Moses reluctantly goes to Pharaoh and says, let my people go. And what does Pharaoh say? Nope, I don't think so. In fact, just since you asked, that made me mad going to make the work harder on them. So then the Israelite people go to Moses, who's supposedly this great leader for them, and they're like, why did you do that? You should have just kept your mouth shut. Now it's worse. Now he's made our work harder. And God speaks to Moses again, and he says, Moses, I mean what I said. I'm going to do an amazing supernatural work that will cause Pharaoh to send the Israelite people out of Egypt. And he reminds them, I'm Yahweh. I'm the self-existent God. And he gives Moses instructions in Exodus 6, 6. That's where we'll pick up. He says, say therefore to the people of Israel, I am the Lord. And there we see his name in all capitals. That's what Ann told you last week is your signal in your English Bible that this is the Hebrew word Yahweh. I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from slavery to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. Well, we know he does this by the plagues. He sends a series of awful plagues among the the Egyptian people. He turns water in the Nile to blood. There are frogs. There are gnats. There are flies. The Egyptian livestock die. They're covered in boils. There's hail. There's a swarm of locusts. There's darkness. 
And finally, the final and worst plague comes. It's the death of the firstborn. And all the Israelites who put the blood of the lamb over their doorposts are spared. But every firstborn Egyptian boy dies. And Pharaoh says, get out. Not only do the Israelites leave, they plunder the Egyptians on the way. I love how the scriptures talk about it. They're just like, may I please have your jewels? And they say yes. And they get rich on the way out. And throughout the rest of the Old Testament narrative, God says over and over again this mantra, remember what I've done for you. Exodus 15. This is after they've, they've left Egypt. They've crossed through the Red Sea on dry land, and then the Red Sea engulfs their enemies, the Egyptians, and swallows them up. And Moses erupts in this song of praise Exodus 15, 11, he says, Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders? You stretched out your right hand. The earth swallowed them. You have led in your steadfast love the people whom you have redeemed. You have guided them by your strength to your holy abode. This event of the exodus becomes so important for the people of God. Like I said, it's a mantra that's repeated over and over again. God says, remember, I'm the one who brought you out of Egypt. I redeemed you. You're mine. And God intends for that mantra, for the truth that he's their redeemer, to actually color and shape the way they see all of their circumstances. We see lots of mentions of God as Redeemer in the book of Isaiah, and that is uh, poignant because the people are in exile in Babylonia. They find themselves in a very similar situation to the generations before that were in captivity in Egypt. They've lost their homeland, their temple, and basically their identity as a people due to their own sin. And it's in that super bleak scenario that the Lord says, Don't forget! Don't lose hope. Don't have spiritual amnesia and forget who I am. I am your redeemer and I'm going to bring you out. This concept of redeemer is something that is pretty foreign in our Western culture, but it was absolutely woven into the fabric of Hebrew culture. It's hard for us to get because we're such an, an individualistic society. But everything for them was centered around their tribes, around their clans, around their families. So there was this concept of a kinsman redeemer. The word in the Hebrew is goel. We don't have a great English word for it, but kinsman redeemer is as good as we can get. It was the nearest adult male blood relative who served as, as an advocate for any vulnerable or unfortunate clan member. So they would redeem or restore lost property or people or the ability for their deceased clan member to be able to continue on in their lineage by having children. And this is so important. Listen, the kinsman redeemer's actions were aimed at correcting any disruption to clan wholeness or well-being or shalom. Shalom being ultimate peace the state of being that is right and that was intended by God. So here are some examples of how this might work. Let's say you have a clan member who had to sell some property to stay afloat financially. The Goel could redeem or reclaim that land for his brother in poverty by buying it right back. If a clan member had to sell themselves into slavery or servitude, the Goel could go and redeem them out and restore freedom to them once again. He could also assist a clan relative in a lawsuit and make sure that justice was done for them. And he also had the opportunity to marry the wife of a deceased clan member in order to ensure the continuation of that family line and to make sure that whatever property was theirs would stay in their family. And y'all, this was an enormous gift to women in that day. Things were very different than they are now. It would have been incredibly hard for a widow to provide for herself. 
So a kinsman redeemer would help older widows as well. He would adopt her as his own mother and care for her throughout the rest of her life. This might bring to mind the story of Ruth. Do y'all remember the story of Ruth? Ruth and her mother-in-law, Naomi, they find themselves both widowed and with no way to provide for themselves. And so Ruth says, I'm going to go. I'm going to gather uh, some, some wheat that's left over in, in the fields. And she finds herself, by the providence of God, in the field of a man named Boaz. He's a very generous farmer. In fact, he tells the men to leave extra for her. He prays for her. He notices her noble character. And she goes home and tells her mother-in-law, hey, I met this really nice guy. And his name is Boaz. And he helped us. And she says, Boaz, that is our kinsman redeemer. You have to go to him. You have to ask him to redeem us. Ask him if he would marry you. And so she does. And Boaz says yes. Boaz says yes. He redeems Ruth and Naomi and their land, provides for them. The Bible story ends with a genealogy that tells us that Boaz and Ruth were the great, 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 great grandparents of King David, the father of the Messiah. This kinsman redeemer played a really integral role in all of us having salvation today. I think it's really interesting to note that the nearest of kin, they don't have to do this redeeming. This is why Ruth had to go to Boaz and kind of vulnerably put herself out there and ask. He doesn't have to say yes. It's his choice. And when they do, they're motivated by life continuing, by increasing of lineage, by the multiplication of life through their line. They're motivated by proper land allocation, the family uh, taking hold of the places that are rightfully theirs. And he's motivated by freedom. He doesn't want anyone in his family to be in bondage or captivity or slavery or poverty. The kinsman redeemer is motivated by shalom, that all might be right and be at peace. Let me give you one more picture of this. It's a different concept, so I want us to have different pictures to get our minds around it. A modern-day picture is that of uh, the mission of the International Justice Mission. They're a global organization that partners with local justice systems, and they are looking to end violence against people living in poverty. And guess what? They're aiming to actually end slavery completely in our lifetime. It's a major problem, too. On their website, they say that there are 40 million slaves globally. There are more than ever in human history today. Slavery is a multi-billion dollar industry generating $1.5 billion annually. And these slave owners prey on the poor and the weak. One out of four victims are children. IJM rescues and restores victims by actually going and finding these children and families who are enslaved and are victims of violence and forced labor and sex trafficking. And they work together with local police to rescue them out. And then they meet the urgent needs of those victims. They provide them safe housing and food and godly counsel education, medical care, and they walk alongside them until they are fully restored. But they don't stop there. They also work with local law enforcement in investigating and arresting and charging these slave owners, and they have skilled lawyers who are making sure that those slave owners spend the rest of their days behind bars. And lastly, they work to strengthen justice systems so that traffickers and abusers can't exploit people living in poverty. I recently learned of a podcast IJM has called The New Activist, and they did a series uh, in recent months on a girl named Esther. They tell Esther's story in five segments, and it is fantastic. I would commend it to you if you have not listened to it. Esther is a girl who's from Ghana, and when she was a young child, someone came to her parents and said, let us take her, we'll make sure that she gets a good education. But they weren't interested in Esther's education. They took Esther and they enslaved her, 
making her work in the fishing industry. And for nearly a decade, she labored, she suffered, she was abused, and she was held captive. She didn't know how to swim, but she was forced to work in fishing boats. As a young girl, they gave her sharp knives to prepare the fish, and she had to work over an open fire. Way too young to know how to deal with those things properly. This was her life with no hope of escape until the bravery of a few changed her entire trajectory. Why don't you watch this? Esther was born in a small village uh, at the southern part of uh, Volta region. The father one day had a visitor who came around and asked that they want somebody to stay in a different community. But the purpose was not for her to go to school, it was rather to work in the fishing industry. Did you think you would ever get to leave that place? No. She never liked the place. She never liked the place. There was a boy, Geoffrey, who was trafficked to that area. We were given information by our police partners about this young man named Jeffrey. They conduct a rescue operation at that point, rescue Jeffrey, bring him back. We do a small debrief with Jeffrey, and Jeffrey's telling us all this information about the rest of the kids that are out there. They are plenty of many. They should go back and rescue them too. aftermath is that because of Jeffrey's bravery, the police took him back and he helped to identify nine other children, including Esther. The police took Esther to a safe house and made two different arrests. And then Esther supplied information to IJN that led to the rescue of 12 more children. They are doing beautiful, beautiful work. IJM does such a fantastic job of demonstrating the heart of God as Redeemer. 
And the story of Esther points us to how we've experienced the fullness expression of God as Redeemer in our Savior, Jesus Christ. All of us are Esther. We are. Hebrews 2, verse 11 tells us that he is not ashamed. Speaking of Jesus, he's not ashamed to call us brothers. Jesus has humbled himself and taken on our flesh that he might be our kinsman. Ephesians 1 verse 7 says that in Christ we have redemption through his blood that is the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. Colossians 1 13 and 14, tells us that Jesus has delivered us from the domain of darkness and he's transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. Galatians 4, 4 through 6, tells us that when the time had fully come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might be adopted as daughters and be able to cry out, Abba, Father, in an intimate relationship with him. And Titus 2.14 proclaims that Jesus has redeemed us from all lawlessness, meaning this state of living where we ignore God's rule and reign and we say, I'm going to go my own way. Jesus has redeemed us out of that kind of lawlessness to purify us as a people who are his and who are now zealous for good works. Jesus has liberated us from the penalty and the power of sin. He buys back our pain and shame and heartache, and he's brought us into a kingdom where there's fullness of life and where we have eternal purpose. Amen? So here's what this means for us. If you have trusted in Christ, you can say, I have been bought back from the grip of Satan, sin, and death, and I belong to God. Jesus has ransomed me with the cost of his very life, so I am not a slave to my sin anymore. I don't have to obey my sinful nature. I won't bear the penalty of death that my sin deserves. I'm free. You can say, Jesus has paid the debt I owed to God. He's exchanged my unrighteousness for his righteousness, and he's restored me to right standing with God. And listen, this has so many implications for the way we suffer. So many. Do y'all remember Job? Oh, my goodness. I don't know of anyone who's suffered more horrible things in a short amount of time. Job had sores all over his body. He lost seven sons and three daughters. All of his wealth vanished in one afternoon. He'd become repulsive to his wife and despised by his brothers. And he's sitting on an ash heap outside of town when he's been wrestling this, these things down with his friends theologically. And he comes to uh, Job 19.25 and he says, For I know that my Redeemer lives And at the last, he will stand upon the earth, or some translations say dust. The word dust emphasizes that God will appear at the ash heap on which Job sits. These dust and ashes symbolize the depths of Job's sorrow. And he's saying, listen, God will take his stand in defense of his kinsman integrity on the very place of his humiliation. My God's going to do it. My Redeemer lives. Job has confidence that out of this sorrow, God's going to restore his honor. And if we have a Redeemer, then certainly all of our suffering is going to be redeemed. There is no misstep. There is no mistake. There is no rebellion. There is no circuitous route. There is no abuse that he cannot redeem. There are no bonds he can't break. There are no relationships he cannot heal and make whole. There's no illness he's unable to heal. And there's no darkness he can't overcome. Our suffering is never, ever, ever hopeless. Because you have a Redeemer that lives. Also, you having a Redeemer speaks deeply to your self-understanding. 
Because when I know myself as the redeemed, my past isn't what defines me. My family of origin doesn't define me. Amen? (laughs) My accomplishment or failures do not define me. I am now the redeemed of the Lord. See, he looked upon me and he decided, he chose for his glory and my joy to be my kinsman redeemer, that life might flourish in and through me in every way, that I might have all the territory that he's intended for me to have in the spirit, that I have this great spiritual inheritance and he wants to make sure that I have access to all of it. So let's call on our Redeemer. I want to give you just some real practical language. When we're facing something that seems impossible, when it seems like a situation cannot be made right, let's let things like Jeremiah 50, 34 be our confession. And these things I'm putting up on the screens, these aren't word for word the actual verses. I've I've made them personal confessions, if you will. But let's say... My Redeemer is strong. The Lord of hosts is his name. He will surely plead my cause. Or Isaiah 41, 14. You are the one who helps me, Lord. My Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. Or Isaiah 48, 17. O Lord, my Redeemer, you are my God who teaches me to profit, who leads me in the way I should go. Let's begin to confess that right in the face of those mountains that seem immovable. Well, I, uh, I, in addition to my purse and my wallet, I got a new makeup bag recently. And um, it was one of those freebies you get when you order a, a mascara. And I just love a good freebie, don't y'all? <laughs> love it. Um, but I brought a picture of it to show you. I've got a photo. It's coming, I promise. Is it coming? (laughs) Or should I just tell them? I should just tell them about it. I will just tell you. You know what? I have it. Lauren, will you grab that teal bag right there and hand it to me? It's real. Let me tell you, I love the bag. It's, it's the right size. That's important. If they give you a bag this big, I mean, that, all my lipstick won't even fit in that. This is the right size bag. I know you can't read this from far away, but let me, let me read it to you. It says, she needed a hero, so that's what she became. <laughs> of all the things to print on a great makeup bag. Let me tell you, this this is the spirit of the age. This is the spirit of the age. You have a need? Look inside yourself. I mean, can you think of a more despairing instructive? I get to the top of the stairs and can't remember why I'm there. I'm supposed to be my own hero? It's terrifying. I mean it. But praise God, y'all, after looking at the broken pieces of my life, I have the privilege of gazing hard into the face of my heavenly hero, capital H, my Redeemer who lives and works to bring freedom and peace on my behalf. Let's pray. Father, we bless your name. We command our souls in this moment to bless the Lord with all that is within us. We bless your holy name. And we will not forget all your benefits. You are the God who forgives our iniquity. You're the one who heals our diseases. You are the only one who redeems our lives from the pit, who crowns us with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies our desires, and we bless you. We thank you that you have not left us, that you've made a choice. You've made a choice to identify with us as our kinsmen, And then you've come after us to rescue us out of darkness. And we're so grateful. 
God, I thank you for this word this morning and the anointing that attends it. And I pray that if there are any women in this place who are bound up, who find themselves in captivity of any kind, that you would break those bondage places this morning. We trust you for it. God, I pray for any woman who in here is hopeless, that she would hear your call to remember, to remember who you are. And God, give us grace upon grace to be honest about our hardship and our brokenness, but to gaze into your face, our all-sufficient Redeemer, our Deliverer. And we'll give you all the glory and praise. Well, you know what, God? We can't wait. We're going to be giving you all the glory and praise forevermore when we're around your throne, saying with people from every tribe, tongue, and nation, you are the one whose blood has ransomed these people. And we long for that day, and we say, come quickly, Lord Jesus, and redeem us to our final home. In Jesus' name, amen.